Hi, what I have here on the workbench today is another lithium iron phosphate battery from Cyclone Bat. If you recall, I reviewed their 12 volts, 100 amp hours mini battery not too long ago, and during that testing, the battery behaved pretty well. I will leave a link to that video in the video description below. If you are interested, you can check it out. Anyway, this one here is also a 100 amp hour LIP battery. Size wise, it's slightly larger because it is not a mini, but rather a standard Group 24 size. But it comes with Bluetooth connectivity and you can monitor the battery status via the Cyclone Bat phone app, which we'll take a look in just a little bit. Believe it or not, I actually like the matte finish of the battery case. I know the case doesn't really matter, but all the other batteries in my possession all have glossy battery cases. So I guess this is just different. After all, a battery is a battery. How it looks has nothing to do with its performance. So I guess we'll need to test it out in this video. The product manual is fairly comprehensive and it's similar to what's provided with the other Cyclone Bat batteries. From the specifications, you can see that this battery has low temperature charging protection, which would cut off the charging current if the core temperature is below freezing. LFP batteries should not be charged below freezing, as it would cause permanent damage to the cells. The BMS also has low temperature discharge protection as well. LFP batteries can be discharged at low temperatures, but the capacities are greatly reduced. So these charging and discharging protection features are definitely good to have. Then you can see here we also have high temperature charging and discharging protection as well, which definitely gives you peace of mind. The maximum continuous current is rated at 100 amps, which we'll test shortly. The peak current here you can see is specified at 130 amps with 10 seconds cutoff. So I think we should be able to verify the cutoff time later on. Although I might not be able to verify the 330 amps 5 seconds cutoff time because I don't have reliable weight to generate this kind of load. But if the BMS works correctly for the 130 amps cutoff, we have no reason to doubt it wouldn't work for the higher current. Let's see what else. Here we have the recommended charging method and the charging current. The charging current is recommended at 0.2C. And let's see what else. And here it talks about the series and parallel configuration. And a maximum of 16 batteries can be configured in this 4S, 4P configuration. One thing interesting is the battery orientation illustrated here. Just like the Mini, you cannot lean it forward or have the long side facing down. As you know in the Mini, the prismatic cells are mounted sideways, with the terminals facing the camera. So I'm assuming that cell orientation within the battery case is the same as in the Mini. Basically, they're mounted sideways. That's why you cannot have the battery facing down like this. And here is the information about how to store the battery, how to set the inverters, and so on and so forth. And yes, there is a Cyclone Bat battery app. You can download and it will recognize the battery via Bluetooth. Let me actually show you that on my phone. Once started, you can see that we picked up all the batteries that are using the Bluetooth protocol here. This means that the same app can communicate with different brands of batteries. If you recall, the virtual battery app we demonstrated before seemed to be able to filter out other battery brands. Presumably, that's by the serial number here. If you look at the serial numbers, you can see that we may have some issues here, as I have a couple of batteries from Second Bat also are Bluetooth enabled. You can see here, they have identical serial numbers printed on the top. And the only difference is the MAC address, I believe, that is printed down here. One is ending EF, the other one is ending 3D. And if you have a lot of batteries, it's going to be very difficult for you to discern which battery you are currently monitoring. Especially, we don't even have the MAC address printed on the battery itself. So you will have to, I guess, judge by the distance or trial and error. And sometimes because the distance measurement is not that precise, you probably won't be able to tell which battery you're currently connected to. So that's actually a problem. My advice for Cycle and Bat is just to print this MAC address on the battery itself, so you can easily tell which is which. The Vectra battery I reviewed a while ago, for example, has a serial number printed on the battery case, so you can easily tell which battery you are currently monitoring. Anyway, let's click on the battery and let's see what we got here. By the way, the battery currently is selected, so we can go to the dashboard, and you can see the current status. The battery currently is fully charged. The voltage measured is 14.2 volts. And here it shows you the status, whether or not the battery is healthy, also it's charging or it's discharging. And also we can go to the cells, it will tell you the status of each of the cells. Right now, for example, you can see that the highest cell voltage is 3.556 and the lowest is 3.546. So 
So there's a 10 millivolts difference, and that is actually typical after balancing. As you can see here, we also have the battery temperature being monitored, and this is definitely very good. Of course, we'll take a look at the charging discharging when the battery is in use a little bit later. Obviously, I have no way of knowing the long-term performance of this battery and how it degrades over time. But I will be using this battery along with my other batteries regularly, and I will let you know if I run into any issues. The good news is that I haven't seen anything wrong with any of the batteries that I have reviewed so far on this channel, but I will definitely let you know if I do. To test the battery capacity, I first fully charged it up to 14.6 volts using the recommended 20 amps or 0.2C charging current. And after battery is fully charged, I held voltage at 14.6 volts for a few more hours, allowing the battery cells to be properly balanced. The balancing actually took quite some time, at least during the initial charge. I think it took at least a few hours after the overall battery voltage had reached 14.6 volts. At first, I thought the voltage differences among the cells were quite high, and I was a little bit worried. But after a few hours, all cells balanced to be within 10 millivolts of one another. To discharge the battery, I chose a 0.1C discharge rate, which is 10 amps using my electronic loads battery testing feature. Now, the actual discharge rate probably doesn't really matter, as for LFP batteries, the capacity doesn't really degrade much as you increase the discharge rate. But 0.1C is a convenient number. One benefit of LIP batteries is that the discharge curve is fairly flat compared to the other battery chemistries. So the terminal voltage does not drop significantly until the very end of the discharging cycle. I set the cutoff voltage to 9 volts on the electronic low side. You can see that there is some voltage drop across the wires used. So the voltage across the battery terminal is about 1 volt higher than what is reported on the electronic load. I also captured the moment the voltage on the electronic load dropped below 9 volts, which is the cutoff voltage. As you can see here, the battery voltage dropped off very rapidly towards the end. We are able to get over 103 amp hours out of the battery, and it definitely meets its rated 100 amp hours capacity. I charged up the battery again after the capacity test, and now let's actually take a look at the internal resistance. The specs didn't mention anything about the internal resistance, so I'm actually curious to find out. Let's use a couple meters to verify that. Let's first use my Fenersi HRM10, and this is a battery internal resistance tester that I reviewed a while ago. So let's actually take a look here. You can see that the measurement results we got from this HRM-10 is just under 7 milliohms, which is pretty decent. Now let's verify it with another internal resistance tester. And here is the measurement from the tooltop IR502. You can see that the result is quite comparable. The maximum sustained discharge current is rated at 100 amps, so let's actually test that out. For the testing, I'm using a couple of inverters so that I can generate the maximum load, and I'm using a varia connected to one of the inverters so that I can adjust the connected load using an electric heater. And the other one, I'm just going to run an electric heater at a lower wattage so that we're able to generate the load required for the battery. Anyway, let's give it a go. So let me first power on one of the inverters. And let me power on the other one. So the other one is controlled by the Variac. So let me see if I can ramp up the voltage here. Of course, I need to turn on the Variac first. So right now we're at roughly 100 amps, and we'll let it run for a while and see how the battery handles. And by the way, while it's running, you can see on the phone app, you can see also we are displaying that it's currently drawing 103 amps. So it's pretty much the same as what is measured by the meter here. So that's very good. Also, you can see the status is discharging, and the rough runtime is about 54 minutes. And we have been running at 100 amps for a few minutes now. You can see that right now the capacity dropped to 94%. And so far, no problem at all. And let's actually verify the internal temperature here. The internal temperature reported is just at 20 degrees, so no problem at all. So let me actually increase the current to 130 amps, and it should cut off in 10 seconds, according to the spec. So let's try that. And I'm going to show you the phone here so that we can 
monitor the status. Actually, let's change it back to, yeah, this is fine. Oh, so now it seems we caught off and it's not quite 130 amps. Let's see what the status is. Yep, it's standby. And let's actually reduce the load and see if we can reproduce that. Let's turn off the load and see how long it takes to recover. And it took about a minute before the battery recovered. And let's actually try it again. So let me power it on. Let me start increasing. So now it's 130, roughly. Yep, looks like the protection worked out pretty well. As you can see, it did cut off within 10 seconds. And right now we're back to join zero and the battery is in standby mode. And the battery is barely warm from the thermal camera image. In the spec, we didn't see any mentioning about peak load current. So let's actually see if we can handle the inrush current from an electric drill. For the next test, I'm going to let the heater run and we're going to draw 100 amps. And then I'm going to start the electric drill and see how it goes. So let's first start one of the heater and I'm going to start the other one. Let's I'm going to draw 100 amps. Now we're drawing about 100 amps. I wanted to stabilize for a few minutes. Okay, let's start a drill. By the way, it will be loud. Here's a drill. One, two, three. One, two, three. And you can see that it worked pretty well. No problem at all. For the last test, I'm going to run at 100 amps and see what the thermal profile looks like after a few minutes. And you can see here right now, we are at 87%. So we'll let it run until it drops to about 40 minutes and we'll take a look at the thermal profile. All right, we have been running with the maximum load at 100 amps for about 10 minutes now and everything is still holding up. And you can see here, the batteries are doing pretty well. The cells are still fairly well balanced and also the maximum temperature is only at 27.2 degrees or 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So no issues at all. Now I did take a thermal image and you can see that we are seeing a few hot spots on the top here. Now I suspect that's actually due to the wiring heating up. As the battery temperature is still pretty cool. Now let's take a look at the dashboard here. And you can see that we are actually a little bit over 10 minutes now. We are currently at 70% capacity and the battery is discharging. So everything is working pretty well. And now I'm charging off the battery. I just want to show you in the app here. You can see that we're also indicating is now charging and the charging current is 20 amps. It even gives you the estimated charging time. Here is a one hour, 32 minutes. So this second battery LLP battery performed pretty well in our test today. It also was able to handle the maximum current with no issue. The phone app actually worked really well. If they can print out the individual serial number on the battery itself, that would make monitoring a lot easier if you have a lot of these batteries. Overall, it's a pretty good battery. Anyway, I hope you find this video useful. If you liked it, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.